I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Douglas to join us now. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you uh, for the introduction, Donald, and uh, to Dave Kilgour for inviting me to speak today. I just want to uh, find this. How do I get the slides? Ah, straight on. Great. Uh, at what is an extremely important event, event and at an extremely important time, I think, brought into sharp relief um, earlier this week by the call going out from the Instant Neighbour Food Bank for food having, having run out of it. Uh, and the response to that call, I believe, was quite incredible. Um, so I think the, the, you know, the fact that this event is happening in this week is, is, uh, is, is really important. Um, the reason that I think I was invited to speak originally came from um, work that uh, a group of us from the Public Health Nutrition Group were doing with CFINE uh, Dave and uh, Christine last year, um, where we had, a, we had the privilege of having one of our students, our MSE students, um, spend some time in the food bank as, as her research project, working um, with uh, people in the food bank, talking to people who were using the food bank, and the thesis was her, uh, was her story or her, her findings from that experience. Um, which she successfully defended. Um, we presented the results of that work at the Public Health Faculty Conference in November last year, and we've consequently ha have a paper that's almost ready for uh, submission for publication. Um, but on hearing the fact that we had Carlin, uh, Mary Ann and Carlin and Dave and uh, Raymond speaking today about the experience of delivering uh, and, uh, and using a food bank, I thought it would be perhaps more useful to tell you about another piece of work that myself and colleagues from the Health Economics Research Unit, Glasgow University and Warwick University have been doing, looking at uh, house insecurity or food poverty in Scotland uh, more uh, widely. Um, but before I do that, um, I'd like to, um, to take this opportunity to share some learning that myself and some others in Scotland, and Marianne included, um, have, have come to know um, from our cousins across the pond in North America who've been dealing with issues of food poverty and food banks for over two decades and have a, a substantial body of uh, evidence uh, and knowledge that they have built from that. And I think um, in order, as, as the commission piece of work uh, that I'm talking about a little bit um, it, it is attempting to do is to widen the debate a little bit beyond food banks, so to speak. So uh, some lessons from abroad. Um, this is a slide that actually I was sent by Professor Graham Reiches, who's a Emeritus Professor of Social Work based at the University of British Columbia, who's one of the leading international experts in the area of food poverty and emergency food aid in, in the world. Uh, he actually, he's from the UK and spent some time working in Glasgow, I believe, in the 70s. Some, some may, may have come across him uh, in their past lives as well. Uh, but Graham, uh, along with his colleague uh, Valerie Tarasuk and uh, Professor Janet uh, Popendiak, who's based in the States, um, at, the moment, at the moment are, are, are great sources of knowledge and inspiration to those of us who are concerned about food poverty and food insecurity in Scotland at the current time. And I would commend their, uh, these, both these publications uh, um, to you um, as, as the last word on what we know about food banks and emergency food aid um, globally. The, this book on the right it was published in 1993, I think, by Janet Popendiak and is an inc incredibly insightful and uh, evidence-based account of uh, the rise of emergency food aid food banks in the States um, over the last 20 years. Um, and uh, uh, if, we, if we think we're, we, this is all very new and, and uh, 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 and, and we, as we stumble through what to do about this, I think this uh, could act as a guide for, for many of us um, if we, we have some time to, us to, to, to become familiar with its contents. Um, this book published uh, last year was actually a republication, a second edition of a book, book that was published, I think, a decade ago, looking at first world hunger, um, and this time with uh, Graham with Tina Salvasti from Finland, uh, and is a collection of, um, as I say, global experiences of emergency food aid. Again, I would commend that to you. And really, just what I'm presenting is a speed distillation of some of what these, what these publications contain and other uh, papers that uh, support, support their conclusions. Um, 
basically, and I have to say I have noticed as I'm sitting at the table because I was speedily preparing my presentation that some of the grammar and sentence construction is not always put, uh, correct, um, so apologies for that. It's always when you're looking at it, you're about to speak, you think, oh God. Anyway, so I have noticed that some of it all is not written in English. Um, I hope you forgive me. I was finishing at 7 o'clock last night. Um, one of the things that the, the international evidence tells us is, over 20 years, food banks consistently run out of food. Um, the uh, nutritional quality of donated food, both corporate and public donated food, can't be guaranteed. So food banks struggle to provide their uh, clients with a, a balanced diet and, and struggle to provide it on a, on a regular basis. Um, and as I say, with what we see in Aberdeen happening this week, it's a, you know, a beautiful case in point of, of this well-documented uh, effect. Um, the US experience in particular shows it's been a useful way for big food court producers to offload their food waste uh, that they would otherwise have to pay landfill tax uh, to get rid of. Um, food banks suffer from volunteer fatigue. Again, well documented. People just, I mean, it, it, people volunteer on the basis and understandably so, of feeling the need to do something and, and, and if, you know, to, to feel that they're, they're actually helping, um, but find over time that you know, the, 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 the crisis that they have come to help hasn't gone away and, and they, are, uh, you know, they, ha they have lives to lead, they have children to look after, they have elderly parents, whatever. So they, 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 you know, they, there is a constant throughput of volunteers who, who suffer from this issue. And, important, and hugely importantly, the, the, the fact of the matter is that stigma keeps many people away from food banks or emergency food aid who might, who might benefit it and who need it. And this, again, is, is well documented. Another issue, food banks in Canada, uh, this is a data that was uh, reported in the Toronto Star uh, from a group who are campaigning in Ontario to get food in the budget in the, in this, in the social security uh, um, entitlements. Um, where they have looked at the data, they have looked at um, the, the food that's donated both corporately and from public donations and can see very clearly when you look at demand for food aid and what's available, it falls well short and in fact they've calculated that it only provides 9% of the food intake required uh, for, for those who seek to use them. Um, food Banks Canada is one of the world's um, leading food bank organisations. Um, and in its annual report in 2014, um, where they, uh, for the first time, acknowledged uh, that food, uh, they first, for the first time, acknowledged that after 20 years uh, of, of uh, providing uh, organised food aid, that food banks are unable to adequately address household food insecurity over the long term, and that food banks do not provide assistance to all of those who are food insecure. Um, and Graham Wright, as as has. has, has uh, uh, confirmed this recently from the data that despite the fact they have a national institutionalised food bank network Canada, um, in Canada, there's no evidence that food charity um, has been an effective response to systemic food poverty. Um, and the reason that I'm showing this slide, this comes from the report, that this is the front cover of the report, uh, is to remind me to, 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 to make the point that um, this is something that happened in Canada and the US in response to a crisis, an economic crisis, austerity, uh, in the uh, late, uh, early 90s or so. And the belief was that this was something that would be short term um, and that eventually the, you know, the food banks would not be needed um, as economic recovery happened and people uh, were able to afford to, 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 to pay their bills. But in fact, what the, and this is from Food Banks Canada, shows is that the demand has, has not dropped significantly over a 15-year period. Uh, at, the, at the present time, the, the most recent figures um, are that there are um, nearly 900,000, just short of a million people um, in Canada looking for, uh, approaching food banks um, for uh, help. So in this context, um, what, is the, what, what does food poverty or food insecurity look like? Well, in Canada, this is and why I'm using Canada as an example, they're one of the, country, uh, one, they're one of the few countries uh, in the developed world who actually measure or who re routinely record uh, food insecurity status at population level. So they, 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 they have uh, questions in their community health surveys that are sent out uh, uh, on an annual basis that ask about people's um, uh, food, food uh, position, food insecurity or security. And from that data, they can, we can tell, or, or uh, researchers can tell, that 13% um, of the Canadian population is uh, food insecure, according to this measure. 
Um, but, there's all, but there is within what we call within country variation, and, and I know to, to give an example of what I mean by that, we know in Scotland, for example, we have huge variation in, in terms of life expectancy in, in different parts of this country, although we have an, av an average life expectancy which is, has been improving. Um, so within Canada, in terms of food insecurity, there's huge in country variation. So in polar Canada, um, I can't actually pronounce how, how it is in the uh, uh, the uh, indigenous language that it's now called, but that 49% of people in this area of Canada are food insecure. There's also variation according to household type. So 34%, I was absolutely flabbergasted by this, 34% of female lone parents are living in Canada um, who are, are food insecure. And 19% of those are moderately to, severe, uh, to severely food insecure. Here's another interesting thing. 62% of food insecure people are working, and this is in Canada. Um, food insecure, we know from, again from the research that food insecure people are more likely to suffer ill health due to food poverty and have more difficulty managing their underlying health conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, liver or kidney problems due to their food insecurity. And from a public health perspective, that that's ringing lots and lots of alarm bells in terms of not only the emotional and uh, social and personal costs to individuals, but also in terms of health, future health care costs. Um, and this uh, food insecurity also uh, affects uh, low-income groups mo uh, most profoundly. In fact, it's one of the reasons that I became involved um, in, uh, in, in this area, having spent the last six or seven years of my career working in uh, obesity-related uh, research uh, and inequalities-related research, it's pretty obvious that uh, people on low incomes are, when we look at the data in Scotland, are more likely to be overweight or obese, and, and particularly the case with women um, and, and children. And, um, and studies show in the States uh, and, and uh, in, uh, in the Global South that those who are in, uh, on low incomes are more likely to be overweight and obese. And I think we need to start to think about that in terms of, as I say, the public health challenge that I've been working with, uh, obesity in Scotland. Um, and here, and we're getting right down to it here, not all people who are in food poverty use food banks. In fact, because of the data in Canada, we can see that only 20 to 30% of food insecure Canadians use food banks. Um, and therefore, food bank data is considered to seriously underestimate the prevalence of food insecurity in Canada, but also in the UK. La uh, um, last year it was last year it was published it was done in the year before uh, defra commissioned report into emergency food aid um, that was conducted by liz dowler and colleagues um, uh, reported that uh, from the evidence such as it was in the uk what what it could what, what was obvious that is food bank use is the action of last resort for most people um, and that people will have used a range of different strategies um, before um, fronting up a food bank, such as cutting back, trading down nutritional quality, skipping meals, um, and relying on family or friends before af approaching a food bank for help. And it was knowing these trends um, that uh, Community um, Food and Health Scotland, who are now part of NHS Health Scotland, commissioned a piece of work um, to look at this issue in a bit more depth in Scotland uh, last year. And, um, myself and colleagues uh, were uh, successful in, in getting that commission and because of that we are um, also uh, able to do the work with support from um, the Rural and Environment Science, Environment Science and Analytical Services uh, uh, division that funds, uh, funds me. <laughs> um, and so we're looking at this is issue as I say uh, beyond food banks. Um, the research objectives that we've been given through this commission is to look at the current prevalence nature and trends in food poverty in Scotland, food, or food insecurity in Scotland, to try and determine which, uh, how food poverty is being experienced by particular, particular vulnerable groups and how community food initiatives are adapting and planning to adapt to practice to address the challenges uh, created by this context. So what they're doing now and what they think they'll need to do in the future to uh, meet uh, the, the challenge of uh, growing uh, evidence of food insecurity, uh, growing numbers of experience of food in insecurity in Scotland. Uh, I've been using this term of household food insecurity. Um, this is the definition that we were also given uh, to underpin the research that we're doing. 
um, by Health Scotland, um, and it's Liz Dowler and colleagues' definition, um, which um, says that food insecurity is a condition where an individual is unable to acquire or consume an adequate quality or quantity or sufficient quantity of food in socially acceptable ways or the uncertainty that one will be unable to do so. Um, but this is also an area where there is actually debate about what do we mean by food insecurity. Uh, and another, and I'm just for interest, I'm, I'm uh, popping this, this, this definition, the FAO uh, definition, which also the Scottish Government are looking at uh, in terms of the work that we are doing at the Rowett, is this defined when people at all times have physical, social, economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food, nutritious food to meet the dietary needs and food preferences for an active life. But both definitions obviously communicate that food poverty is a, is a multifaceted, multidimensional thing. It's not just about hunger or immediate hunger, albeit that that is a huge and important issue to address uh, at, at emergency times. So what we're doing is... Um, Three, sub, three studies are what we have done because this work is, is almost completed or it has been completed uh, and we're just doing the write up um, is a rapid literature review so we're looking to see what do we know from the research evidence in Scotland and the specific Scottish context about food poverty we're looking um, at uh, conducting a, what we call a secondary analysis of routinely uh, uh, collected uh, Scottish food purchasing consumption and diet quality data compared with other household expenditures using those with an income of 60% below the median income as a poverty indicator. And we're also conducting qualitative research um, by interviewing um, um, key informants from, from organisations and services that provide um, service and advice and support to vulnerable groups and the groups we were tasked with looking at specifically were those facing destitution, homeless groups, older people, uh, asylum seekers ref and refugees um, and uh, travelling people uh, specifically. Um, and also interviews with um, uh, informants from community-based food, community food programmes throughout Scotland. And I spoke to, uh, personally I spoke to a couple of people who are in this room and I think my researcher Fiona McKenzie might have spoken to a couple of others here today. Um, as I say, the data collection is finished. Um, we are currently finalising the report which um, will be uh, available towards the end of May, uh, according to the meeting we had in Edinburgh last week in terms of uh, deciding on final um, dates and deadlines for, for various drafts. Um, and so, and, and at that point, um, I'm sure there'll be some a dis dissemination event, um, and the, in fact there are planned dissemination events uh, of the findings of that. Uh, piece of work, and, be, and because it, the work is not concluded, I'm not planning to, and, uh, to, to speak any more about the research itself. However, if people have got questions and they want to ask me about them, I've been given permission to, 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 to share those by the commissioners um, uh, uh, today. Um, I just want to finish by um, to providing a little bit more co context that I think is important um, to, to highlight, given that this is a fast-moving and changing situation. Um, the, I think it's important here in, uh, as well in Aberdeen that you, to, to, to flag up things that you, you may or may not be aware of have been happening around this uh, issue um, in other parts of Scotland. Um, for the first time, I was speaking to a colleague just um, before we started, for the first time in Scotland, the directors of public health are speaking out about this issue um, and it's been described in the public health world as a public health emergency. Um, and in uh, and March, uh, beginning of March, the directors of public health for Glasgow, uh, sorry, for, for Greater Glasgow and Clyde and for Lothian um, uh, published a, a joint statement expressing concern uh, about malnutrition and lowered life expectancy of children in Scotland due to food poverty and welfare reforms affecting their parents. Um, there's also been a Beyond Food Banks conference that took place in, in Glasgow um, at the end of February. Uh, where questions were being asked about, what, you know, uh, based on the, 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 the information I shared with you about the Canadian and the US experience, you know, is, should, we be, should we be hurtling down the food bank path? Um, can we think about this and broaden the debate and think about other ways of tackling this issue? Uh, and that, that is a movement, as they're calling themselves, that intends to continue. And, and there's a planned uh, uh, follow-up event in September, I believe, um, in touch with the, the organisers of, of this uh, event, um, to take forward this agenda. Um, 
The other thing that uh, I'm sure many of you, or most of you in this room will know, is that just at the start of March, uh, there was a Scottish severe poverty in Scotland report published um, showing what's been happening in terms of trends in severe poverty in Scotland. Um, and what we see is that uh, what it shows that uh, in the last decade, while relative poverty has fallen, um, despite a rise in most recent years, the, the, a greater proportion of households in poverty, that there is now a greater proportion rather, of households living in poverty who are now in severe or extreme low income and, low, and poverty. Um, and it's estimated that 16% um, of the population are living in relative poverty, with 10% and 4% living in severe uh, and extreme poverty, respectively. However, when you factor in housing costs, what the report also shows is that uh, it makes a considerable difference to the numbers of people who are affected by severe or extreme poverty. And in Aberdeen, we, you know, we know the cost of housing. <laughs> That's a big issue I was hearing about on the way in this morning. Um, and, and, it, and it changes the figures quite dramatically in terms of what's available, what's left over for people to buy food. Um, and almost finally, this was some, again, this I think is unprecedented. There was a joint poverty statement on food poverty from the leaders of Edinburgh and Glasgow City Councils, uh, again, February 26. And I'll read it out in full because I think it's, it's worth reflecting on for this uh, seminar today. This is not the full statement, but I think for the point of view of this, uh, um, session, it's the, the key thing. And they argued that many people have given food and time to food banks. This generosity reflects the goodwill and compassion our cities are famous for. However, food banks are a crisis response to an immediate problem, not a sustainable solution to food poverty. In particular, the expansion of the food bank system uses waste food from the supermarket system proposed by a recent uh, all-party inquiry into hunger in the United Kingdom is deeply flawed. Experience elsewhere has shown that when food banks become too well established, they undermine the fundamental rights enshrined in our welfare system. If we become too reliant upon them, we risk a return to charity welfare. This must not happen. Powerful stuff. Um, and I want to, then, on the back of that statement, um, pose this question that uh, Graham Reich is writing in the Nourish Scotland magazine uh, uh, very earlier this year, asked of us, you know, is it ethical or economically and socially a good thing to allow vulnerable people to be fed through a system of corporate food waste, in, uh, 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 ever increasing tons rather, of corporate food waste into a secondary food system? Um, and I would like to finish by acknowledging the commissioners of the report, Sue and Rockcliffe and Bill Gray from Community Food and Health Scotland, and my co-researchers, Ada Garcia from the University of Glasgow, um, Zoe Ejiba, Linda McKenzie, and Ludbrook from the Health Economics Research Unit, Fiona McKenzie, and uh, Liz Doyler from University of Warwick, and all the participants who took part in the, the qualitative research. I hope to do justice to their um, contributions when we have the, the report in with Health Scotland. And I'd like to finish there, and I've probably taken far too much time.